to my next video. I'm going to continue my series on nomads, uh, uh, books for nomads. And today we're going to look at Nomad Land, uh, a fantastic book. And I'm going to go so far as to read some of you to you. I, I hope it's not too boring for you, but I just want you to see and feel her heart her experience, her knowledge. And I think once you do, it will help you make the decision. This is a book I would really like to read. And so we're going to, I'll, I'll just not talk about it. I will actually read a little bit of it to you. I hope you can forgive me for that. I love uh, books on tape and maybe that'll give you an idea of books on tape. So let's get into that now. I consider Jessica a friend. She, um, she didn't just study us. She, she, was, she teaches journalism at Columbia University. She's an associate professor there. And, uh, and so about three or four years ago, she got interested. She, she's interested in counterculture, and that's what we are. We're counterculture. And so about three or four years ago, she uh, came to the RTR and met people and did stories, uh, wrote a story for Harper's Magazine. She became pretty well known. She did a lot of TV after that and was interviewed a lot. So she really introduced the people to the nomadic lifestyle and, and how many of us there were. But she became really fascinated and decided she'd write a book. So she bought a van herself and lived in it for three years. She traveled with us. She got to know us. She's camped with me many times. I consider her a friend. If I saw her, I'd give her a hug and, and say, good to see you again, Jessica. I hope you're staying a while. Uh, She's a wonderful young gal, really intelligent, very friendly, not, not highfalutin or pretentious at all. I really, I really enjoy um, Jessica a lot. I think she's a great gal, great person. She actually traveled with us. With, uh, she made a couple of really good friends and traveled a lot. One of them is Linda May. That Linda May will be a prom prominent uh, person in the book. She went and worked with Linda. She worked as a campground host. She worked at the Beet Harvest. She worked at Amazon. So she's not just writing about um, being a van dweller and being a nomad. She did it. I mean, I think she feels that pull herself, that counterculture pull. And so she went and did it herself. I, I, it's a good book. And I'm, I'm going to do something a little different. And I'm going to just read you the foreword to the book because the foreword is really well written and really interesting and I think you might enjoy re me reading the foreword to you. Now normally the, I, the principle is what well, you never just read to people because how much boring can that be? But I love audiobooks and why is that different if you watch me re read it? And if it does bother you, uh, put something over the screen and just listen to it. I love audiobooks. In fact, my, one of the recommendations I'm going to make to you is you buy all these books on audiobooks and listen to them as you drive. It's something I always do. I always have an audiobook going while I am driving, and it's something I recommend for you too. So I'm going to read the foreword. You'll know a lot about the book. You'll know a lot. You're going to hear things that, you know, these are all things I would uh, say to you and teach you. Okay, foreword. Uh, Nomad Land by Jessica Bruder. As I write this, they are scattered across the country. In Drayton, North Dakota, a former San Francisco cab driver, 67 years old, labors at the annual sugar beet harvest. He works from sunrise until after sunset in temperatures that dip below freezing, helping trucks that roll in from the fields disgorge multi-ton loads of beets. At night, he sleeps in the van that has been his home ever since Uber squeezed him out of the taxi industry and making the rent become impossible. So he used to be a, a taxi driver and lost that job. Great. My might cut some of this out, some of the de description. Uh, continuing reading. In Campbellsville, Kentucky, a 60-year-old ex-general contractor stows merchandise during the overnight shift at an Amazon warehouse. It's mind-numbing work, and she struggles to can't scan each item accurately, hoping to avoid getting fired. In the, morning, in the morning, she returns to her tiny trailer moored at, one of the, moored at one of the several mobile home parks that contract with Amazon to put up nomadic workers. In New Bern, North Carolina, a woman whose na home is a teardrop-style trailer, so small it can be pulled with a motorcycle, is couch serving with a friend while hunting for work. Even with a master's degree, the 38-year-old Nebraska native can't find a job. And I know a lot of people just like that can't find a job despite filling hundreds of applications in the past month alone. She knows the sugar beet harvest is hiring, 
but traveling halfway across the country would require more cash than she has. Losing her job as a nonprofit several years ago is one of the reasons she moved into the trailer in the first place. After the funding of her position ran out, she couldn't afford rent on top of paying off student loans. In San Marcos, California, a 30-something couple in a 1975 GMC motorhome is running a roadside pumpkin stand with a children's carnival and a petting zoo, which they had five days to set up from scratch on a vacant dirt lot. In a few weeks, they'll switch to selling Christmas trees. In Colorado Springs, Colorado, a 72-year-old van dweller who cracked three ribs doing a campground maintenance job is recuperating while visiting with family. And she knows all these people. She met with them, she talked with them, she got to know them, she worked with them side by side. This is the real deal. Uh, and there's gonna be a lot of complaints, and when I'm hearing them already, that she emphasizes the bad news end of it and de-emphasizes all of us who have chosen this. But she, it, it, she does write from a point of view, and she, but not, it's not 100% one-sided. But you have to understand that. It's a human interest story, and human interest stories require a human interest. Uh, it, it requires some drama, and so she emphasizes that part. But I think it's a balanced overview, and she never lies. I mean, what everything she says is true, it just leaves out probably more than we would like to hear of the people who just really want this life and choose it more than or for, as much as are forced into it. So I'm going to continue reading the forward. There have always been itinerants, drifters, hobos, restless souls. But now in the second millennium, a new kind of wandering tribe is emerging. People who never imagined being nomads are hitting the road. They're giving up traditional houses and apartments to live in what some call wheel estate. Vans, second hundred RVs, school buses, pickup campers, travel trailers, and plain old sedans. They're driving away from the impossible choices that face what used to be the middle to class. Decisions like, and this is in italics because it's the decision people are making. Would you rather have food or dental work? Pay your mortgage or your electric bill? Make a car payment or buy medicine? Cover rent or student loans? Purchase warm clothes or gas for your commute? And you know what? That's every word of that is absolutely true. There are a lot of people who are making those decisions and that's why you're here watching this video. So this book is written for you. It's not written for everyone, but it is written for you. And it's written to make aware, the country aware, that that is a real reality in our country. And that needs to be done. For many, I'm continuing reading now, for many the answer seemed radical at first. You can't give yourself a raise, but what about you're cutting your biggest expense? Trading a stick, a stick and brick domicile for life on wheels. And how many of times have I said these exact words to you? You can't give yourself a raise. All you can do is reduce your expenses. And so these people said that to themselves. And Jessica knows that and is relaying that. You have a choice. So that's why I'm recommending this book. She's doing the work I want done. She's telling people you have a choice. And the choice is to reduce your, income, your expenses if you can't raise your income. And so I really like that. Some call them homeless. And how many people have called us homeless? If you've told your friends and family you're gonna do this, nearly all of them have responded by saying, well, you're just gonna be a homeless bum. You're gonna get killed. On, you're gonna be living on the streets under, a, under, a, um, under a, a bridge. Some call them homeless. The new nomads reject that label. Equip, equipped with both shelter and transportation, They've adopted a different word. A, they refer to themselves quite simply as houseless. And that is what I do. I think each of you of us, if you're watching this, I think of you and I myself. From a distance, many of them could be mistaken for carefree retired RVers. On occasions when they treat themselves to a movie or dinner at a restaurant, they blend with the crowd. In mindset and appearance, they are largely middle class. They wash their clothes at laundromats and join fitness clubs to use the showers. Many took to the road after their savings were obliterated by the Great Recession, and boy, is that so true. To keep their gas tanks and bellies full, they worked long hours at hard physical jobs. In a time of flat wages and rising housing costs, they have unshackled themselves from rent and mortgages as a way to get by. They are surviving America. I really like that sentence. They are surviving America.
But for them, as for anyone, survival isn't enough. And that's, that's my message to you, isn't it? How many times have I said that? I try to say that after every video. Survival isn't enough. So what began, began as a last-ditch effort has become a brave little cry for something greater. <laughs> Again, this is, she's describing me to a T. Being human means yearning for more than subsistence. As much as food or shelter, we require hope. Preach it, sister. And there is hope on the road. I'm going to read that again. If I had a highlighter, I'd highlight it. And there is hope on the road. What is there on the road? There's hope. This is a good book. And there is hope on the road. It's a byproduct of forward momentum. A sense of opportunity as wide as the country itself. A bone-deep conviction that something better will come. It's just ahead in the next town, the next gig, the next chance encounter with a stranger. As it happens, some of those strangers are nomads too. When they meet online or at a job or a camping way off the grid, tribes begin to form. There's a common understanding, a kinship. When someone's van breaks down, they pass the hat. There's a contagious feeling, something big is happening. The, comfort, the country is changing rapidly. The old structures are crumbling away. And they're at the epicenter of something new. Around a, champ, a shared campfire in the middle of the night, it can feel like a glimpse of utopia. Man, that's just, it's just true. That resonates with every fiber of my being. As I write, it is autumn. The winter will, soon winter will come. Routine layoffs will start at the seasonal jobs. The nomads will pick up camp and return to their real home, the road, moving like blood cells through the veins of the country. Oh man, I love that sentence. Let me read that to you again. Pay, listen carefully to the sentence. The nomads will pick up camp and return to their real home, the road, moving like blood cells through the veins of the country. They'll set out in search of friends and family or just a place that's warm. Some will journey clear across the continent. All will count the miles, which unspool like a film strip of America. Fast food joints and shopping malls, fields dormant under frost, auto dealerships, mega churches, and all night diners, featureless plains, feedlots, dead factories, subdivisions, and big box stores, snow capped peaks, the roadside reels past through the day and into darkness until fatigue sets in. Bleary eyed, they will find places to pull off the road and rest in Walmart parking lots, on quiet suburban streets, at truck stops amid the lullaby of idling engines. Then in the early morning hours, before anyone notices, they're back on the highway, driving on. They're secure in this knowledge. The last free place in America is a parking spot. Now, that's brilliant writing. That's brilliant, not just brilliant writing. There are a lot of brilliant writers in this country. That's brilliant writing from a woman who's been on the road, who can feel the call, who, who has camped beside others and felt the mutual call who's joined the tribe. Uh, this is a book that I recommend. I just think um, you're going to have some quibbles, of course. Is it perfect? Of course not. Uh, is this a great book? I think it is. And I really recommend this book to you. So there you have my book for reviews. Watch for lots more. I'm going to be doing lots of them. I'm going to, that's going to be the way I communicate who I am, let you inside my heart and mind, and uh, communicate my philosophy is through book reviews. And I'll do it kind of like today. I'll do some reading uh, of important passages in the book. And, uh, and I, so if you didn't enjoy that, I'm sorry. That's kind of the only way. It's the way I think I like to do it. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, uh, like us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. Tell all your friends there's a better way of life. Do not settle for a mediocre life. Do not settle for a mediocre life. Do not endure life until the end and then you die. Don't sit in a rocking chair waiting to die. There's life. There's vibrant living. The veins of America run hot with nomads. And maybe you should be one of them.